Good afternoon. Our first item of business today is a statement by Jean Freeman on the infection incident at Royal Infirmary Edinburgh. The Cabinet Secretary will take questions as usual after a statement. I would encourage members to press their request to speak buttons if they wish to make a contribution and I call on the Cabinet Secretary. <coughs> Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm grateful for this opportunity to update members on the actions taken by NHS Lothian in response to an infection incident at the Royal Infirmary of Edinburgh. On the 19th of March, NHS Lothian wrote to all patients who had uh, aortic valve replacement operations in the six-month period between September 2018 and March 2019 to advise them of a low infection risk arising from their surgery. These precautionary letters, which were sent to 186 patients, were triggered by the following events. On the 19th of February, we were advised by Health Protection Scotland through the normal channels of a patient who had contracted a mold infection and who had undergone cardiothoracic surgery at RIE. On the 20th of February, NHS Lothian established an incident management team to investigate this matter and set the Healthcare Infection Incident Assessment Tool at red due to the severity of the illness and public concern. NHS Lothian followed this on the 26th of February by, rightly, instigating a re retrospective review of all patients over an 18-month period. From that exercise, 186 patients were identified for whom there was a low infection risk. Measures were put in place to contact these patients by letter and to provide them with contact information to use for any follow-up questions they had on receipt of the letter itself. To date, a total of 26 patients who have received letters have contacted NHS 24. 19 of these patients have been passed on to the board for further discussions. Additionally, information has been provided to local GPs and to cardiologists regarding symptoms to be aware of and guidance on appropriate testing and onward referral should that be needed. Turning to the infection itself, three types of mould infection have been identified which have affected six patients. Sadly, some of those six patients have died. No further cases have been identified since November 2018, but I know that the whole chamber will join me in offering our sympathy and condolences to the families and friends affected. The three types of mould identified are Lyhemia corymbiferia, Exophilia dermatitis, and Expergillus. None are commonly found in hospitals. NHS Lothian proactively undertook an extensive investigation of this incident and, as they should, sought the help of Health Protection Scotland, who have visited the hospital at the board's request and is providing comprehensive expert support to them. The detailed investigation is being undertaken by the lead infection control doctor, together with NHS Lothian's Director of Operations and Director of Technical Service. Health Protection Scotland have visited the wards and theatres involved. A comprehensive question set relating to ventilation within the cardiothoracic theatres was devised by the lead infection control doctor, lead infection control nurse, with some additional questions from Health Protection Scotland. The response to these questions has satisfied the infection control team and the director of facilities that the ventilation within the theatres concerned is operating within acceptable parameters in terms of air pressures, air changes, air flow, and no concerns are noted relating to filters. In addition, of course, NHS Lothian have implemented the further steps we would expect to minimise the risk of further infection spread, including additional and specialised cleaning and environmental decontamination with hydrogen peroxide vapour in all relevant wards and theatres, a review of practice and air and water sampling from both the environment and specialist equipment. As a precaution, four planned elective surgeries at the hospital were cancelled last week to allow for these additional preventative measures to be carried out. Elective operations recommenced on the 26th of March in two of the four theatres, subject to this additional preventative work, and the other two will be operational when the additional cleaning, air sampling, and other measures have been completed. 
All patients whose operations were cancelled have now had their operation rescheduled over this week and next. Presiding officer, I completely understand that for patients who have been contacted by the board, this will have been a worrying time. But let me repeat, the board were right to undertake a review of cases and to inform patients they identified as a result of that exercise. These precautionary steps were the right ones to take, designed to minimise risk and to provide a clear pathway for those with concerns to access services as easily and efficiently as possible. Presiding officer, this is the right time for me to say again that in Scotland we have learned valuable and wide-ranging lessons from the tragic experience at the Vale of Leaven Hospital over a decade ago. And it is important to recognise the significant improvements in patient safety that have been made and sustained in those 10 years. Healthcare associated infection outbreaks are rare and whilst it is important to respond when they do occur and to recognise that they are of critical importance to the individuals and the families affected, they do affect a very small proportion of the 1.2 million inpatient and day cases treated every year in Scotland. With the introduction of the National Infection Prevention and Control Manual, assessment, reporting and escalation of outbreaks is a far more robust process. Infection prevention and control teams undertake active surveillance of certain organisms and can therefore identify outbreaks after finding just one or two cases. As part of outbreak investigations, boards undertake active case finding to look for cases retrospectively and prospectively. The current precautionary steps undertaken by NHS Lothian resulted from an extensive review of the records of thousands of patients who had many different types of surgery carried out since the beginning of 2015. This demonstrates a rigorous approach by NHS Lothian to ensure patient safety. Overall, the board has a strong record. Figures published on the 12th of February this year show that their hospital standardised mortality ratio fell by 2% at the Royal Infirmary of Edinburgh, 10.4% at the Western General and 136 at St John's over the four-year period of January to March 2014 to July to September 2018. In addition, NHS Lothian have seen steady reductions since 2014 in both Staphylococcus aureus, bloodstream infections and C. diff infection. As regards infection associated with caesarean section and hip arthroplasty, NHS Lothian are on a par with the rest of Scotland. In terms of positive results from MRSA testing, since 2007, NHS Lothian has seen a 98% decrease, comparing well to the 93% decrease for Scotland overall. Clearly, there are processes we can improve to make our hospitals as safe as they can be, which is, why, which is what the Scottish public has every right to, accept, to expect. As my colleagues on Parliament's Committee for Health and Sport have recently noted there are lessons for us to learn from the recent incidents in Greater Glasgow and Clyde, particularly the importance of robust communication between infection prevention and control and estate staff. This is especially important during maintenance or repair work of the NHS Scotland estate when extra control measures need to be put in place to reduce the risk of infection. When I updated Parliament on the 26th of February, I announced that I had commissioned an independent review to look at the design, build, commissioning and construction, handover and ongoing maintenance at the Queen Elizabeth University Hospital and how these matters contribute to effective infection control. In order to ensure appropriate membership of the review committee, the independent chairs of the review, Drs Brian Montgomery and Andrew Fraser, have been taking advice from experts and who will best be able to contribute, as well as analysing and reflecting on the work that has been done to date. From this, they will determine the precise remit of the review and the resources and support they will require. And we expect the independent chairs to consult on a draft remit shortly. In addition, we are strengthening the roles which NHS Scotland individual infection prevention and control team members play and the expert service they provide. Next week, to provide further reassurance of the efficacy and robustness of our approach, our Chief Nursing Officer will meet Board Healthcare Associated Infection Leads 
to reinforce their responsibilities in terms of infection prevention, emphasizing the mandatory surveillance requirements contained within the National Infection Prevention and Control Manual and ensuring boards have local mechanisms in place to ensure that the manual is reliably and sustainably implemented in their board. In conclusion, presiding officer, I recognise that no patient wants to receive a letter similar to those sent by NHS Lothian last week. But I hope that what I've outlined today provides reassurance that these letters form part of a proactive precautionary infection control and risk management system here in Scotland. Not all healthcare associated infections are preventable, but we do have dedicated professionals and a rigorous system focused on limiting and controlling them. A system that is alert for a potential infection risks, how to assess and manage those risks, and a system that consistently looks to improve. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. I call Miles Briggs to be followed by Monica Lennon. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And can I start by thanking the Cabinet Secretary for advance sight of this statement. As a Lothian MSP, I know um, from concerned constituents who have contacted me and their families just how hard this has been. And actually, I'd like to start by sending my sympathies to the families and friends of the six patients who have been infected or who have died, as well as 186 patients who have been contacted as a precaution. Can I therefore ask the Cabinet Secretary, in terms of moving forward around this case, what plans does the Scottish Government have to review biological infection prevention as part of the patient safety initiative in light of these cases we've seen across NHS Scotland? And will the Cabinet Secretary also look to review how this Parliament is updated on such cases when they occur and outbreaks across Scotland like we've seen over the past few months? It's quite clear that public confidence has been shattered recently in our NHS estate and it's something we need to all work to address. And I think that's something on a cross-party basis in this Parliament I hope the Cabinet Secretary will also look to take forward. Cabinet Secretary. Um, thank you. I'm grateful to Mr Briggs uh, for his question. Uh, in terms of, of the really important first part of your, your question about um, what more can we do in terms of patient safety in looking at these uh, unusual infections, because they are, uh, I have asked the National Clinical Director uh, to begin some work uh, looking at uh, where we might find uh, international uh, information and expertise uh, and whether or not it is the case that uh, these infections uh, always existed uh, but were masked by MRSA, C. difficile, etc. And as we are successfully bring those ones down, which we have done and that needs to be recognised, then uh, these small outbreaks of these others, critical though they are because of the impact on patients, emerge. And we need to understand them better and know more about them. Uh, and also know uh, not only uh, what might trigger their occurrence, but how we can prevent them. So I think it's a really important point, and I am very happy as that work progresses to ensure that the Health and Sport Committee, because I think that would be the right place, is kept advised of, of what we are doing to progress that look. You would expect it might take some time, but we'll keep you up to date. In terms of the wider question about updating Parliament, I think it is, again, a very fair point. Uh, I have tried to do that, uh, partly by uh, always responding positively uh, when statements are asked for or initiating those myself, using the GIQ process and writing uh, to the committee uh, as appropriate. I'm very happy uh, to talk with the uh, opposition party spokespeople about what more you might think I can usefully do in that regard. And if members are content with that, then uh, we will organise just such a discussion. Monica Lennon to be followed by Andy Whiteman. Thank you. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for advance sight of her statement. And on behalf of Scottish Labour, I offer our condolences to the families of the people who died after contracting mould infections at the Royal Infirmary of Edinburgh. We recognise too that it's also very distressing for, for the staff at the hospital. But unfortunately, here we are again. It's a different hospital, a different city, different infections, but the outcome is the same. Patients have died and public confidence continues to dip. The Cabinet Secretary rightly mentioned the Queen Elizabeth University Hospital, as well as the lessons from the Vela Leaving outbreak of 10 years ago. None of us want to learn of any further tragic outbreaks, no matter how rare or how few patients are affected. So can I ask the Cabinet Secretary what actions she has taken personally since taking up her post to ensure that routine monitoring in all of our hospitals 
is as excellent as it can be, in particular to protect vulnerable patients from these potentially fatal infections. Cabinet Secretary. I'm grateful to uh, Ms Lennon for her question. Um, I think it's important to say, uh, of course, uh, we all want to see the minimal uh, infection uh, outbreak in any of our health, any of our healthcare settings, whether it's acute community health and social care, whatever it might be. But it, and that is absolutely, I'm sure it's shared with Ms. Lennon and Mr. Briggs and others. Uh, absolutely, uh, my complete focus. Patient safety is the most important thing that any cabinet secretary can focus on. But we need to accept too that not all healthcare infections are preventable. And some emerge that are resistant to existing medication and resistant forms of treatment. And to some extent, whilst our uh, medical advances are exemplary and much to be acknowledged globally, there are times when we are playing catch up to how infections and bugs uh, work to uh, be resistant to antibiotics, for example. Uh, in terms of my own uh, personal uh, involvement in this, uh, I have, of course, as you'll know, uh, I'm very happy to set out a full list uh, for Ms. Lennon, but uh, I've, I have, as you know, uh, tasked the, the uh, previous Director General uh, and the current one uh, with uh, direct contact uh, with uh, Directors of Estates, uh, work with infection control leads. Uh, we have a regular uh, update on uh, all of the issues that this uh, hospital, uh, this uh, chamber is aware of. We have raised it with chief executives at every meeting. I have raised it with the chairs. Uh, we have made, paid particular attention to the question of uh, maintenance and estates uh, and continue to do the work on that. And again, we'll update the chamber on that. So this is a constant part of the job that I am doing uh, because it matters so much. Andy Whiteman, to be followed by Alex Cole Hamilton. I thank you, Presiding Officer, and I thank the Cabinet Secretary for advance sight of her statement. I also wish to associate myself and Scottish Greens with her remarks and offer sympathy and condolence to the families affected. Health Protection Scotland says it's essential that lessons are learned from outbreaks. Uh, it's not clear to me what lessons are to be learned from this. And first, on a point of clarification, uh, in her statement, I think I heard the Cabinet Secretary write when she said that none of these moulds are commonly found in hospitals. The, the written statement that she circulated in advance uh, to members said, says none are not commonly. I w wonder if she could just clarify that in fact these are unusual moulds and her oral statement was in fact the correct uh, one. Um, and finally, the, 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 her, her statement indicates that, um, that, uh, uh, that acceptable par parameters were found uh, in, the, in the hospital and that preventative work was undergone, but nowhere in her statement did she actually indicate why these moulds were found in an operating theatre and I'm wondering if we know why. Secretary. Uh, thank you very much, and I thank Mr Whiteman for that. Can I just correct? Uh, there was a double negative in the written statement, uh, and uh, he is correct. What I said is the right thing. Uh, these are uh, uncommon and uh, not found in uh, hospital environment infections, which is part, I think, uh, of what lies behind Mr Briggs' question about, you know, if this is unusual, what is happening here? And that also takes us to the point about uh, Mr Whiteman's first uh, part of his question about what lessons are to be learnt from this. Well, one of the lessons is that we need to investigate further uh, if these are, are, given that these are unusual, not found in acute settings, uh, then why has this happened here? And what is the exact nature of this? In terms of the source, uh, so far, the source has not been identified, uh, which is why in my statement I made the point about uh, the ventilation system and the, the work that had been undertaken in the ventilation system. The normal process that, uh, goes, that an infection control uh, team goes through to identify source, looking at where there is commonality if the more than one patient has been accepted in terms of healthcare staff or equipment or location uh, has not produced a source. Uh, and we continue uh, to search for that. Uh, the lessons from it, uh, are in part uh, any improvements that can be made to the operating manual. Once we uh, have identified the source, uh, then there will be lessons to be learned from that. Uh, ensuring that uh, we continue to be re robust across all our boards in the application 
of that national manual, which is precisely why the Chief Nursing Officer is taking the additional action that I outlined in my statement. All of those are continuous lessons. And of course, we have learned that we need to pay very close attention to the quality of the engagement between estates and maintenance and facilities and infection prevention and control. And we are checking and looking to make sure that all of our boards are learning those lessons. So there, there, is, there are always lessons to be learned. And uh, we're very keen to make sure that that is always the case. And despite uh, the overall good record in infection prevention and control across the NHS Scotland, that complacency is never allowed to slip into this and think that we've got, uh, we've got this exercise covered because there is always more that we can do. Alex Cole Hamilton to be followed by Emma Harper. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And can I associate these benches with the remarks of sympathy to those affected? 186 letters have been sent out in total, but only 26 patients have proactively contacted NHS Lothian. Is the Cabinet Secretary confident that everybody has received and understood the risks associated with the infections to which they've been exposed? And on the question of mould, I understand she can't say where the source came from, but can she say where these moulds are commonly found? Are they domestic moulds, agricultural moulds? And will that help her in in the investigation to follow. Cabinet Secretary. Um, so on the, the latter part of the question, where are these moulds commonly found? That is part of the work that is going on at the moment uh, to try and help us then, uh, if we can uh, do any more in terms of the investigation, to look at where, uh, where they might be, how they might have uh, uh, reached that acute setting. Uh, in terms of the uh, numbers of people who have so far responded out of that 186, um, I have asked the board to provide me with uh, assurance about uh, how sure they could be that everyone did receive those letters. I think there's a fairly straightforward way of doing that, and so uh, I'm expecting them to return to me with that information. Very happy to make uh, Mr. Cole Hamilton aware of that when I have it, and indeed other members. Uh, un received and understood is the understood part is, is difficult, um, but uh, those, many of those patients will have uh, continuing appointments with either their GP uh, for the, the issue in, for, uh, from which they had the operation in the first place uh, or from the, the consultant uh, concerned. And uh, that is why we made sure that our cardiothoracic consultants across, not just this board, there may be some patients who uh, had their uh, procedure in Lothian, but they come from another health board, but also uh, all GPs are aware of this issue, aware of the symptoms, aware of the systems that have been put in place to assist uh, any of the uh, 186 so that they can continue uh, to raise that uh, with patients as they come before them. Uh, I'm not sure if there is more that we could do in that regard, but I'm very happy uh, to look to see if there is, uh, should anything be suggested. I'm conscious all the parties and front benches have asked the question. There are nine members wish to ask a question. There are six and a half minutes left, and there's no time this afternoon. So very short questions and succinct answers, please. Emma Harper to be followed by Jeremy Balfour. Thank you. Can the Cabinet Secretary outline whether the whistleblowing process at NHS Lothian would have helped with this investigation of infection incident? And can she provide an update on the plans to appoint an independent national whistleblowing officer in Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I'm not sure if the whistleblowing uh, process at NHS Lothian would have assisted the board uh, infection uh, control, which is proactive, as I described, uh, identified this very early on. Uh, but of course, in other cases, whistleblowing has been of assistance in these matters. Uh, in terms of where we are, uh, we are currently finalising the work with uh, SPSO, uh, who will, of course, take on this role uh, to ensure that we are absolutely ready. And in the, the next few weeks, I intend to outline a series of measures, uh, most of which uh, members are anticipating on all of the actions we need to take on whistleblowing and the result of the review in Highland. Jeremy Balfour to be followed by Colin Beatty. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I know from the Cabinet Secretary that two oper operating theatres are still closed. I also know that she said that all patients in regard to these procedures will be seen within the next two weeks or so. Have other operations have to be cancelled because these two theatres are down? And if she doesn't have information, could she provide how many operations have been cancelled as a result of these two theatres still being closed? Cabinet Secretary. So the, the total number of operations uh, cancelled as a consequence of this uh, infection uh, were four. 
all of those four cancelled operations have been rescheduled, as you said, this week and next week. Uh, the two theatres that have yet to reopen uh, will be reopened uh, as soon as the additional work that was done in the first two is completed in the second two. Uh, and all the other rotas to ensure elective surgery continues, as well as emergency surgery, have been redone to accommodate uh, that uh, downtime, if you like, in those facilities. And as soon as we have the date for the reopening of the second two theatres, then we will, of course, make sure that members are aware of that. Colin Beattie to be followed by David Stewart. Can the Cabinet Secretary confirm that all clinical staff who are responsible for infection control receive ongoing training to ensure they're in line with best practice? Cabinet Secretary. Yes, I can. Uh, all Scottish health and social care staff and students uh, have access to the Scottish Infection Prevention Control Education Pathway. Uh, that is part of their continuous development and their learning. And it is the job uh, of the board and indeed uh, clinical managers inside the board to ensure that everyone is keeping their learning up to date. David Stewart to be followed by Sandra White. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Are there any plans in place that could pick up invasive fungus-like materials such as cryptococcus in hospital ventilation systems before patients become infected? Cabinet Secretary. So, th so that is part of the work that uh, Greater Glasgow and Clyde are currently looking at in trying to uh, identify uh, how that infection entered uh, a closed ventilation system, which is what uh, they rightly had. Uh, and then produce the results that we've discussed previously. Um, that's Gl Greater Glasgow and Clyde are undertaking that work. Health Facilities Scotland are involved with them in doing that. That will be part uh, of what uh, the independent review, of course, looks at. And that will include whether or not there are additional preventative measures, if you like, in the external uh, fabric of a building that can be uh, introduced in order to prevent any infection coming from something like uh, pigeon droppings uh, entering into uh, what should be that safest of all systems inside the hospital. Sandra White to be followed by Gordon Linders. Uh, thank you, President Officer. The Cabinet Secretary mentioned that the three types of mould are very uncommon uh, in uh, hospitals. Uh, we also know that uh, you know, Scotland has a strong record on in infection and control. So can I therefore ask the Cabinet Secretary how Scotland compares with other countries in terms of benchmarking infection control and if any lessons can be learned from these other countries regarding this type of infection? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, um, uh, thank you for that. Uh, the 2016 point prevalence survey demonstrated that Scotland has the lowest prevalence of healthcare associated infections within the UK and Southern Ireland. And in terms of the rest of Europe, uh, Scotland also compares favourably to France, Italy, Spain, Portugal, Greece and Finland. So that is um, uh, of some assurance. Uh, however, uh, today in uh, Glasgow, a three day conference begins. Uh, where Glasgow has secured that. It is the largest uh, event of its uh, type over, t over uh, 24 such conferences, uh, 24, uh, over 24 years, uh, where over 3,000 delegates are coming together from 70 countries uh, to talk about uh, the international learning uh, that we need uh, to be part of to continuously improve our practice. So we are engaged continuously in looking at what more can we learn and what more can we do. Gordon Linders to be followed by David Torrance. Um, can the Cabinet Secretary confirm regarding the 186 letters what follow-up support has been provided by NHS Lothian and also what steps have been taken to make sure that uh, individuals have actually received the letters? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, so I think that the last part I've already answered in terms of uh, Mr Cole Hamilton's question. In terms of follow-up, the letter sets out uh, the basis on which uh, the individual has been written to, the low infection uh, a risk that, that uh, they may be subject to, what are the symptoms that might indicate that, and uh, uh, directs them towards uh, NHS 24, NHS Inform, uh, in the first instance, uh, for any questions that you might have, uh, but also advises them that their GP and their consultant uh, is alert to this and that they can contact them. Uh, and so when individuals uh, make that contact, as we've uh, outlined in my statement, then the board is following that up. Now, that is the right protocol. There is a really clear protocol about how patients are advised of this kind of situation, and that is that it should always be in writing. It should never be by telephone, for example. So the board has done exactly the right thing. 
uh, and then is following up where people uh, get in touch with them. But also, as I explained to Mr Cole Hamilton, these uh, individuals, these 100 86 people will have follow-up appointments with their GP or with their consultant and again that will be raised with them then so to make sure that they understood what the letter said and that they are, they are uh, asked about any potential symptoms they might have. And David Torrance. Thank you, President Officer. Can the Cabinet Secretary confirm what health agencies are working together to support NHS Lowen throughout this investigation? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, so NHS Lothian, as I said, rightly, uh, directly involved uh, Health Protection Scotland. Health Protection Scotland uh, are working with them to provide expert advice. They've also visited the theatres and the wards uh, concerned. In addition, uh, NHS Lothian is in touch with uh, uh, the expertise inside Scottish Government in the Health Directorate and will make use of Health Facilities Scotland uh, in terms of any uh, changes that once the source is identified, may need to be made to the infrastructure at the Royal Infirmary of Edinburgh. But I should stress at this point, there is no indication uh, of any changes required to that internal infrastructure. Thank you. And that concludes our statement. Apologies to uh, George Adam and Neil Findlay. We have run out of time, but we'll move on now to portfolio questions. We'll just a few seconds for the ministers and members to change seats. <laughs>